This place is uh, unholy, uttered Karamak, failing to hide obvious uneasiness in his voice. Their steps, however silently they tried to walk, echoed through the dark corridor, alerting whoever or whatever was hiding down below of their presence. Suddenly, more than a dozen spectral hands started protruding from the walls, floor and ceiling all around them, surprising and reaching for the heroes. Raids and specters, those hateful undead creatures that so often dwell in the deep dark places like this one. Surrounded from all sides in such a tight confined space, Zorja was unable to form a defensive perimeter of beasts and consequently couldn't maintain concentration. Soliana turned invisible and was evading most of the undead life-draining assaults, but her powerful self-defense spells offered little to no offensive capabilities. Karumak was smacking, punching and kicking as usual, but the undead could take quite a beating before succumbing to his strikes. <laughs> I told you your spells are gonna fail you one day, ladies, laughed Grolohilda, just as she unloaded a bolt from her hand crossbow point blank into the nearest specter, finishing off what Karmak started. A wraith came for her right after, but she siphoned some of her own vitality to invoke a blinding curse that made the wraith stumble in the darkness, unable to grasp her at all. As more and more specters were pouring in from the walls, Grolohilda shouted, Retreat! We have to get back to the room up above! As the group was slowly making their way up the stairs, Grolohilda was methodically mowing down the closest specters and wraiths. Zorja, put up a meat shield down the hallway! We'll clean the stairs! she yelled. As Zorja trumpeted another wall of beasts into existence, Karmak, Soliana and Grolohilda turned around and focused all of their attention up the staircase. Through their combined efforts, the trio started working their way up. Grolohilda's barrage of radiant bolts was illuminating the star stairway, leaving a trail of dead specters. She channeled more of her blood into the curses, managing to disorient two more raids descending upon Karmak giving him time to weave away from their life-draining grasp. It didn't take long for the heroes to reach the room upstairs. Just as they entered, the undead stormed right behind, surrounding them again. With so much more space around, Zorja was finally able to form a defensive perimeter, enabling Grolohilda, Karmak and Soliana to put everything they had into their attacks. Destructive spells, bolts and strikes started raining down on the nearby undead, thinning out the swarm in droves. After Soliana unleashed a ball of fire and slew the last clump of specters, Grolohilda shot a mean look her way and scoffed. Heh! <laughs> More undead fell from my bolts than your fancy spells. Everybody laughed a little but their smiles were nervous and happiness fleeting because they knew this was only the beginning of their troubles. Alright everybody, if you like this little intro story, uh, probably not the best that I've done so far, but it's still something. Uh, today uh, we have a very, I'm gonna say, favorite build of mine, the one that I like because, well, I just like Blood Hunters. And uh, even though they are kind of weak uh, and uh, compared to some other classes definitely don't stack up in terms of damage, survivability or, I don't know, utility spells and whatnot, because, well, they are not spellcasters after all, uh, I think there are a couple of ways they can be built, so uh, in this video I'm going to attempt to shine a bit more light on this class, uh, which, uh, upon this third party a class which so many people love uh, largely due to critical role success and uh, Matthew Mercer's uh, homebrew materials so first and foremost as I usually do a little bit of a shout out to my uh, Patreons patrons so Larry Hawk and Alvaro Orenas Orenas I don't know Esteve Bardley Man Hardly Trying Mike Andreas Big Black Bankai Matthew Ewing Brad Olham 
uh, Manozzi, Stefano, Adrian L. Ace Jr., Yaboy Fox, Brian Moten, Sean, Corey Williams, Jeremy Helton, Helton Joel C. Alcazar, Will Ketterer, Zachary Bradley, Rich Million, Dark Sin, Gary Kors, Matthew Collins, Albert Quack, Kelly Bellis, Aiden Hart, Simon Pedersen, Suburban Hell, and Frank Fan. Thank you for your continued support, new and uh, old patrons. Uh, this is uh, this is definite. This definitely means a lot to me, and I'm gonna uh, do my best to continue uploading new interesting builds videos uh, as often and as much as possible. Uh, so yeah, with that said. But the general idea behind the build uh, is the following. Basically, if you ever uh, skimmed across the class, uh, you might have noticed that uh, one of the... A, a lot of this class is actually revolving around these blood curses, called uh, blood maledicts, whatever you want to call them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but the important uh, part about them is that uh, creatures that, are, that do not have blood in their bodies are immune to blood curses. This is up to DM's discretion. So, a lot of creatures that you are going to be encountering are going to be immune to these blood curses. Uh, and this always leaves a lot of power, a lot of discretion to DM to just tell you, well, that elemental you cannot curse it because, you know, it doesn't have any blood. So, for that reason, Order of the Ghost Slayer definitely uh, means that it's one of the only, well, the only uh, subclass of Blood Hunter which completely ignores this at least w once you hit level 7. So that's one of the reasons why I uh, went with the Ghost Slayer. Another one of the reasons is the Rite of the Dawn. Uh, basically uh, the Blood Hunter revolves around hurting yourself in order to do these curses, in order to do more damage. So uh, this this subclass also offers you uh, an, an alternative way to hurt yourself a little bit less in order to deal uh, the same similar type of damage uh, to all the other uh, rights that you can take. Uh, also, uh, in terms of the racial choice, we have uh, the good old Hill Dwarf, and uh, the reason why I why picked Hill Dwarf over, uh, let's say, Variant Human is, uh, well, Variant Human would definitely allow you to have uh, one extra ability score increase due to the fact you would be able to take a feat. But I think the combination of the Dwarven Toughness, uh, which gives you one more hit point every time you level up, as well as on your first level, as well as uh, the Constitution uh, increase plus, your, uh, plus the Wisdom increase, uh, both working uh, together in unison to enable you to have a character which has a decent amount of hit points to allow yourself uh, to, to hurt yourself in order to curse these creatures and deal more damage. Um, as well as having the wisdom and also everything is going to be a lot of things are going to depend on wisdom uh, with this build uh, all of the blood curses pretty much uh, revolve around uh, wisdom well most of them uh, uh, also the supernal surge and uh, the, uh, the the feature with which enables you to add your wisdom modifier to your damage rolls uh, right of the dawn also revolve around wisdom. Uh, your uh, your supernal surge is a level 11 feature, which basically means that you can attack once once more if you take the attack action, and you can use this feature up to your wisdom modifier. So that's one more thing around wisdom. Uh, and yeah, basically uh, in a combination of hallowed, hollowed, hallowed veins. Not sure about the pronunciation. Uh, extra attack because you are a martial class after all. Uh, let's also add that you uh, kind of, uh, for this to work, you need uh, archery fighting style. I think that's pretty much uh, self-explanatory every time you take uh, any kind of martial that has crossbow expert. Um, and uh, yeah, basically extra attack with additional plus two to hit from the archery fighting style. Crossbow expert feat, let's not forget about that. Uh, is very very important because it all enables you to even use the extra attack with the crossbows uh, and uh, on top of that if you are wielding a hand crossbow you can also have a bonus action attack uh, also you don't you ignore the disadvantage in melee so yeah, this is an all-around good feat to have so the combination of all of these uh, things features that you get from your uh, dwarf from the primarily from blood hunter uh and uh, the uh, the feats the feat that you pretty much need with this build 
gives you a blood hunter build which is which has more hit points than most other blood hunters uh, it's a very very reliable damage per round because of your uh, three or even four attacks once you hit level 11 uh, you will have like a lot of chances to deal at least a little bit of damage every round so uh, it's always better to have like four attacks each dealing like 10 15 20 instead of just one attack dealing 100 because if that one attack misses you deal zero so yeah it's always better to deal at least something in terms of just pure damage uh, it's also uh, due to the fact that you are going with the order of the ghost slayer uh, and fairly early into your character progression you will be getting this feature uh, you will have universally useful blood curses that means that even if the creatures don't have blood uh, coursing through their veins um, you will still be able to use the curses on them and also don't forget that these curses and all of your fe other features that you get as you keep leveling up they do offer some minor support and utility options primarily for example blood curse of purgation enabling you to uh, help your allies fight one of these very nasty conditions particularly paralyzed uh, whenever your ally gets paralyzed and you have this uh, curse ready learned uh, it's pretty much very useful to give your ally one more chance to uh, get him or herself rid of the paralyzed condition um, so yeah all in all that's about it uh, that's about it for the like uh, short overall broad strokes uh, breakdown of the build uh, not much to say about it it's like a single class build that goes all the way up to level 20 um, I, I think that multi-classing uh, first and foremost I don't think anywhere in the blood hunter it's even defined what you even need if you want to multi-class i'm not even sure matthew matthew mercer uh predicted this class to be even multi-classable but if you kind of want to multi-class i'd say that you probably talk to your dm i would i would assume that you would need wisdom to be 13 and probably like dexterity or strength maybe even strength uh, due to the fact that uh, you get a strength saving throw uh, from the uh, blood hunter uh, so yeah, basically I would say this is still better to go all the way up to level 20, just single class Bloodhunter, just for the fact that uh, everything scales as you level up, you get more curses, you, these maledicts, you get more uh, damage as you level up. Um, yeah, basically the damage that also increases. So I, I don't think there's any point multiclassing out of the Bloodhunter. Um... But yeah, that said, that's about it for the build. Uh, if you like the build, if you like the general idea of like not always going with the human variant, but instead, you know, like combining the hill dwarves a little bit more hit points, um, a very good uh, ability score, uh, bonuses, uh, and these feats and uh, class features. Like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button. You know the drill. Uh, get notified of my future uploads uh yeah basically that's it for the build uh, if you would like to continue watching uh, where i go a little bit more in depth about all of these features uh, feel free to do so for all of you other people who are familiar with blood hunter familiar with fifth edition and pretty much already have a pretty good idea how this works uh, please uh, come again, uh, I'll have many more videos like this one and maybe even better ones, single class, multi class coming in the near future. So yeah, basically with that said, let's dive a little bit deeper into the build. So, uh, first and foremost, uh, we kind of already uh, went over the uh, point by, but yeah, but this, is, this is how I would propose your starting um, a point by spread uh, to be uh, made. Now, uh, the Blood Hunters actually get the proficiency in the Strength and Wisdom saving throws. So, uh, while you can definitely uh, put, let's say, two into the Wisdom, uh, into the, let's say, Constitution, and then maybe get some feet down the road to get even more hit points, I think having ten uh, in Strength is uh, good just for the fact that of the Strength saving throw, and also... Uh, down the road you will get an additional feat which we will discuss soon after uh, that would uh, pretty much go off of your uh, strength as well so yeah basically uh, hill dwarves get constitution and wisdom both ability score bonuses are good 
uh, because wisdom, you need wisdom for your supernal sir, for like a bunch of stuff with your blood hunter. And constitution increase by two is also good because blood hunters do hurt themselves by using the rights, by using the curses. And uh, yeah, you need health, you need hit points. So uh, combining 16 in constitution uh, with an additional plus one hit point every time you level up from the healed dwarf uh, is gonna uh, is gonna actually provide a hefty pool of hit points for you to rely on so uh, yeah basically you will be able to be a little bit more relaxed in terms of how much hit points you have still you will be you will have to be careful right you're not a barbarian you can't take like too much damage uh, so uh, yeah be careful with that uh, dark vision pretty much like standard 60 feet dark vision that every dwarf gets uh, Dwarven Resilience is very good because you get advantage on uh, saving throws against poison condition and you also are resistant to poison. Poison is one of the, I mean, it's it's monster dependent, it's campaign dependent, it's DM dependent, but poison damage gets often used uh, in a lot of campaigns against PCs. So uh, having just a natural aptitude to be more resilient uh, against poison is very, very good. Uh, Dwarven combat training, you get like a standard thematic spread of weapons that you are just naturally uh, proficient in by, by the proxy of you being a dwarf, right? Uh, some tool proficiencies, you can gain one of the three. I'm not sure which one makes the most thematic sense, maybe brewer supplies, but I think like whatever you want to choose, uh, you can incorporate into your overall character like theme and flavor. Stone Cunning, while your intelligence is gonna be like one of your dump stats, one of your two dump stats, uh, still sometimes having advantage, proficiency, whatever, just like in, in a very situational type of situation, uh, circumstance is still a good thing, like, it's, it's, it's more like a ribbon feature for you, but sure, if you, if you stumble upon some kind of stonework, you will at least have a little bit more a chance of finding out what it is, where it came from, and uh, why it's significant. Uh, finally, obviously, the Dwarven Toughness, uh, the probably one of the most important features that you get from the race. Probably the most important one, I'd say, uh, just for the fact that these additional hit points stack up nicely on top of each other. Even though it's just one hit point, uh, let, me know, uh, let me tell you that uh, that one hit point might matter, because like in a lot of situations, uh, I played uh, Blood Hunter online, not this one, a different one, uh, recently, and let me tell you that sometimes having that one hit point is actually all you need. So, uh, yeah, every time you get a level up, you get one more hit point, and uh, yeah, it's it's good, it's good, trust me, it's gonna matter. Uh, so, yeah, for background, I, it's one of those things that you can take whatever you want, pretty much, but... In terms of just like pure mechanics optimization, I'd say like faction agent makes the most sense because uh, thematically you can be like a legitimate member of some of these blood hunter orders. Uh, so in that in that case, you would be like a, a blood hunter order of the ghost slayer, right? So ghost slayers can be like you can work with your DM to give you some kind of like a official faction which deals with these uh, monsters, um, uh, otherworldly monsters and the uh, sinister aspects of the world. So it can be some kind of like a secret group of, I don't know, a faction or a guild or whatever um, that deals with these things. Um, now, uh, yeah, you get inside perception proficiencies. Pretty much all of these are good. Uh, perception, the most important one. Insight, also very often used. Uh, two language proficiencies, um, you also get the faction equipment and a feature, the safe haven feature if the DM is willing uh, to give you some kind of a flavorfully, thematically uh, relevant kind of faction guild uh, that you can uh, be a part of uh, in the campaign, in the world that you're playing in is gonna, probably gonna come up at some point. I mean, getting shelter in a critical moment uh, from uh, whoever is willing to provide it is always a good thing, right? So... Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, in terms of feats, Crossbow Expert is the one that you pretty much need uh, for all of the all of the things uh, that you uh, th th that it's good for, right? So first and foremost, you ignore the loading quality. 
uh, of the crossbow so that means that you can use any crossbow and still uh, be able to use your extra attack uh, due to the fact that crossbows have a loading property um, they are not they are not being able to, to to be fired multiple times during the turn but with crossbow expert you just ignore this so yeah extra attack will work uh, bonus action attack with the crossbow uh, with the hand crossbow uh, pretty much so instead why just have like two or three attacks uh, have three or four right uh, and also uh, the fact that you can ignore the range attack disadvantage while you're in melee with a hostile creature it's all it also matters because a lot of times you do get uh, you do get you inevitably do end up in melee and in that case you don't have to like finagle your way into like uh, drawing um, a melee weapon you can just keep your crossbow in your hand and um, yeah you can keep firing it like point blank into the into the hostile creatures face so it's good Another feat that I would actually, I mean, it's its not necessary, you can take any other feat that gives you a plus one to dex, but I think like in this particular case, uh, the squat nimbleness uh, feat is pretty much like first and foremost, it would make sense in terms of a character who has like almost very little strength, but a very high dexterity score. So you would be kind of like a dexterous character, more nimble dwarf. Uh, which uh, would be a little bit faster than all the other dwarves. Um, you would gain proficiency in one more skill. In in that case, you would pretty much take athletics, because uh, you would get uh, acrobatic survival, uh, insight, and perception from your background and uh, class. So yeah, I would take athletics. Uh, and also, don't forget, grappled condition is the condition that often gets imposed on PCs by all sorts of monsters. A lot of monsters like crocodiles, frogs, snakes, uh, vampires, you name it, like there are a bunch of them. Uh, every time they hit you they like automatically grapple you. Sometimes the, the grappled condition also imposes the restraint condition. So having advantage on either of these two checks to escape from being grappled and uh, you would get acrobatics from your, uh, from your blood hunter. Uh, it's a pretty pretty good thing to have, uh, it would pretty much make you even more slippery than you already are. And sometimes slippery is all you need to be in order to avoid uh, the danger, avoid uh, imminent like uh, monster hitting you in the face with a bazillion of damage. Uh, so yeah, I think this feat actually lends itself very nicely into this build. First and foremost you would be able to round up your dexterity to 16, so you would have a plus 3 modifier. And also all of these other things combined, uh, stacked on top of each other, pretty much like give you a little bit of everything for all sorts of situations uh, that you can use. It's like a very, very universally uh, useful feat. Um, so yeah, I would definitely go for it. Uh, I mean, you're playing a dwarf, so why not go for a dwarf feat? And on top of that, it's a very, very useful feat, I think, uh, for this particular build. So yeah, I think it's a very good thing to take. Now finally, we have the Blood Hunter. Uh, some of the things that you get, obviously, uh, the starting proficiencies and things like that. So you are a martial class. Uh, Blood Hunters are martial class. So your hit dice is going to be the same as fighters. So it's going to be 1d10. Uh, your proficiencies uh, are going to be in uh, light, medium, armor and shields. All weapons. You will get like alchemist supplies, tool proficiency, um, you will get two skills uh, from all of these listed. Not a lot of uh, variety in the skills, but I think like taking acrobatics, uh, due to the fact that acrobatics goes off of dexterity, you're already very dexterous. Uh, and also um, a survival, I mean, every time you're in the wilderness or whatever, survival is a skill that also gets used very often. I wouldn't go for any of like either arcana investigation because you dumped your intellect but unless anybody else ever anybody like there's no investigation in your party i mean i guess you can take it it's just never going to be that good because intellect is not your is not the skill that you are uh, very good at like so yeah i would definitely go for wisdom and dexterity skills uh, in terms of saving throws, a strength saving throw is probably not going to be that useful. It's one of the lesser encountered strength saving, thro uh, saving throws in the game. 
But wisdom saving throw is gonna lend itself very nicely against all sorts of monsters like spells. Uh, mental attacks that you uh, get subjected to. Uh, wisdom saving throw proficiency is uh, like a very, very good thing to have and you just get it uh, from level 1. So uh, yeah, in that case I'd say uh, it's a very good thing. Even like in late game. Late game wisdom saving throw proficiency is uh, a very, again, a very, very important thing to have uh, as a character because a lot of things go off of wisdom. So yeah for that for that reason i would say it's very very good um start uh, obviously uh with that said you get some of the starting equipment i would go with uh i mean sure you can take uh two simple weapons or a martial weapon i would still go with rapier because uh, you will have to wait like three or four levels three obviously uh if you start from level one uh, you will have to wait a couple levels before you get crossbow expert feed for so for the first couple of levels just having like, like uh, an alternative melee weapon that you can use in melee uh, and not have disadvantage. For that case I would take Rapier. Uh, it, it's a finesse weapon so you can use it with dexterity. So pretty much the same thing as a crossbow. So yeah, uh, that in that regard Rapier, Hand Crossbow and two, 20 Bolts. Now, Hand Crossbows do have a, a very short like range but still like 30 feet range is better than melee. So uh, for that reason and, and the fact that you will be getting crossbow expert right at level 4. So uh, you will be having that bonus action attack. I'd, I'd say it's it's still better to start with hand crossbow. Uh, even though that light crossbow is going to deal more damage and have higher range. Uh, chances are just like in the most campaigns you are inevitably fighting some kind of bandits i don't know uh, some kind of monsters that inevitably drop light crossbows because a lot of those low level uh, monsters and npcs do actually wield light crossbows so in a lot of cases you don't even have to buy a light crossbow but a hand crossbow is a very very expensive weapon it's like 75 gold and it's not often that you get across a character who uses it at lower levels so for that regard, I would still go with hand crossbow. Finally, uh, between studded leather and scale mail armor, scale mail armor provides higher armor class because it's 14 plus 2 from dexterity and you already start with 2 in dexterity. So you're, you're going to be starting with like 16 in AC compared to studded leather, which is 12 plus dex. So it's 12 plus 2, it's 14. The only reason why you would even think about going studded leather is if you are starting this character at a very high level, so your dexterity is, let's say, 18 already. Um, in that case, like, there's no difference be because 12 plus 4 is 16 and 14 plus 2 is 16. I'd say studded leather is better in that case. And also scale mail armor is one of those medium armors that are... Uh, heavy and that they provide they give disadvantage on stealth checks So if you ever want to be more stealthy, I guess the reason w uh, why you wouldn't go for scale mail is that but I would prob probably always take plus two to AC uh, other than a potential uh, Lower role on stealth because you know like that's just me I, I, I think that just having plus two to AC is better because stealthy is not gonna, stealth is not gonna always be used, and the AC is always gonna be used, like almost in every combat, in in like all, all sorts of situations. So, yeah, scale mail is the way to go. Explorer spec, obviously. I mean, what else? Uh, Hunter's bane, a level one feature. You get two features at level one. Um, usefulness of this feature depends on the monsters and NPCs you come across. Uh, now, at level eleven, you will be able to use this feature more. Well, more often, definitely, because once you hit level 11, you can choose to hurt yourself um, and uh, get advantage on insight or intimidation. Now, intimidation, obviously, you're probably not going to be doing that because charisma is only one of your dump stats and you don't have proficiency intimidate. But you do have proficiency in insight and wisdom is one of your main skills. You're pretty much going to be maxing your wisdom. So this is going to be... A feature that's definitely gonna be useful in like tier 3 and tier 4 when, once you want to determine whether a creature is lying or not, right? So, I think this is actually a, a feature that's sort of like meh in the beginning. 
depending on what type of creatures you come across. But then later on, like, uh, if you are sufficiently high level, it kind of, like, scales good into the tier 3 and tier 4 play. Uh, but you do have to wait quite a bit before you get this. So, yeah, I'm not sure, like, that's why I kind of only gave it, like, half red. Because if it's, like, full red, full good, I would give it, like, uh, I would even make the right red. But, uh, yeah, for that reason, uh, definitely, uh, well, not that, like, Hunter's Bane. Pretty much didn't give it any, any red, right? So, uh... Yeah, basically, that's that's my opinion on it. On it. Uh, Crimson Rite. Now, Crimson Rite is the feature that you're probably going to be using. Not probably, but definitely going to be using the most. Because it's just a flat-out increase to damage. Uh, you, become, you begin with, like, a plus 1d4 damage. Now, all of this damage is uh, magical. So, from level 1, you do have a, a little bit of magical damage already. Uh, the Crimson Rite actually doesn't scale that well into the late game. Because the Crimson Rite damage similar to Monk uh, damage die, like, it just incrementally increases. It doesn't even, like, it, it finishes up to 1d10. So, it doesn't really scale that well into the late levels, but, like, lower levels, where you would, in a combination with Crossbow Expert, Extra Attack, and all that stuff, you would be dealing quite a bit of damage just with Crimson Rite, with that added uh, damage from it. And uh, the all of the attacks from the extra attack and crossbow expert, uh, it, like the damage will stack quite quite nicely. And uh, in that regard, I would say like this feature is definitely at least half red, if not even fully red. Uh, but yeah, maybe we can make it like this. So it kind of like it, it's really good. Like it's uh, yes, you do damage yourself, uh, but uh, you damage yourself by your character level. So your hit points are gonna be like uh, permanently lower than your like maximum potential hit points uh, but uh, yeah I mean you you have like on-demand damage increase which works pretty much almost always other than maybe you in you being in anti-magic field but that's such a rare situation in most campaigns that I wouldn't even worry about it um, and yeah in, in terms of these like uh, stock uh, rights that you get I would say that the uh, right of the storm for lightning damage type and right of the oracle which is a psychic damage uh, Oracle is an esoteric right so you would be getting that at 14th level but at like 6th and uh, 11th and level 1 you would get one of these um, one of these three primal rights I would start with right of the storm because I think lightning damage at low levels is the least resisted type Fire and uh, cold is pretty much a very, very uh, commonly resisted damage type. So just for that reason, go lightning because we are optimizing this as much as possible. Um, yeah, in that regard, I would consider uh, those types like the best damage types to go for. Now at level 2, similar to Ranger, Paladin and... Uh, well, that's about it. Uh, you get a fighting style... You are a martial class, so in this, for this reason, obviously, if we are going with ranged attack rolls uh, from crossbows, you pick archery with a plus two to bonus to attack rolls. It's just like one of the best, if not the best, fighting styles that you can get. So yeah, get it. Uh, also, at level two, you get blood maledict, which is pretty much these like blood curses that you get as you keep leveling up. So. You uh, start with one, and then as you keep leveling up, you get more and more uses. Um, basically, this table over here can tell you at level uh, at level three, at level two you get one use, at level six you get two per per short rest, at level eleven you get three, finally at level seventeen you get a uh, four. Now it it is a short rest feature, so uh, for that regard, in that regard, it's definitely going to be. Very useful to you uh, at the beginning because a lot of monsters will at least have uh, blood in them. Uh, but uh, yeah, sometimes you will definitely not be able to use this if the monster doesn't have blood. Unless you hit level 7, obviously, in Ghost Slayer uh, Blood Hunter. More on that very soon. So yeah, some of the curses that I would uh, uh, recommend uh, for you to take before, uh, before others. Uh, definitely, definitely take the Blood Curse of Binding. Uh, because the blood curse of binding enables you to just I mean if, if if there's nobody to grapple some very speedy creature who is trying to get away This curse is gonna pretty much enable you to keep the creature right there in place with like zero movement speed And also if the creature is very large uh, like larger than well 
large i think right so uh yeah it, it can affect any size category if you choose to amplify and by amplifying you pretty much deal your right damage to yourself uh so you would roll one of these damage dice so pretty much like 1d4 and what you get on that number you uh, deal the damage to yourself so uh yeah basically uh i would i would take the blood curse of binding blood curse of the eyeless i kind of referenced it in the intro story uh but maybe if you don't obviously know the blood hunter it's this curse pretty much whenever an enemy who is not immune to blindness and uh i was actually careful enough to uh to check uh, beforehand whether rates and uh specters are and i think pretty much none of them are uh immune to blindness but yeah anyway uh, never mind uh in, in in case none of those creatures are immune uh, to blind uh, you can uh, inflict a sort of like a temporary disadvantage, right? So, if you use your reaction, you can impose disadvantage on the attack roll. Now, this is definitely not gonna guarantee that you don't get hit, but uh, it's pretty much gonna increase your odds a lot by... Obviously, the monster will have to use the lower uh, result. So, also, uh, if you choose to hurt yourself a little bit, if you're fighting a monster that has like multi-attack... Or if there's a monster which deals a lot of damage but only has like a single attack. Uh, amplifying is a very very good thing to have because just like hurting yourself a little bit. Uh, it, it trigger imposes disadvantage on a subsequent uh, attack roll as well. So you, you like with just this single curse you can impose disadvantage on two attack rolls on a single monster. And uh, like, like for the price of taking 1d4, 1d6 damage, it's it's often I I use this curse uh, uh, personally on uh, in online play with the Blood Hunter that I uh, played with, and uh, it's very useful. That binding and uh, eyeless are probably the most useful uh, curses at low low levels and even higher levels. Like at, I played uh, until level 10, and I was I was using these two curses all the time. So. Yeah, I would say they are very, very good. Uh, now, Blood Curse of the Fending right? I would say uh, Dexterity saving throw spells are pretty common in game. A lot of uh, a lot of spells actually invoke Dex saving throws, and a lot of monsters have spells that have Dex saving throws. So uh, yeah, definitely, if you can use your reaction to deflect the spell with your right, um, you can add your Wisdom modifier. Another another thing that goes off of your wisdom modifier uh, yeah i mean it's very very good if you just want to pass those saves and also if you if you if there's a lot of allies around you uh, within five feet of you you can like hurt yourself a little bit like deal 1d4 1d6 1d8 depending on your level damage to yourself in order to grant all of your allies uh, a bonus to their saving throws so this is particularly potent if you have a paladin in your, in your party who has like plus 3, plus 4, plus 5 maybe from aura protection. And then there's a deck saving throw and everybody is like huddled next to the paladin including you. And then you use the blood curse of defending right and then you add additional plus 3, 4 or 5 to that saving throw. It's it's crazy. Like you can have, you can have plus 10 to the deck saving throw uh, just with a paladin in a party. Uh, like the amount of stacking that goes on with these features is crazy. So yeah, um, it's obviously gonna depend on your party, but uh, I would definitely take this. Uh, they take this uh, uh, curse. And finally, the curse that I would recommend is Blood Curse of Purgation. Um, a lot of times your allies get uh, inf inflicted one of these um, conditions. Poison condition is very common, even paralyzed at, at higher levels, so uh, instead of waiting for a cleric or whatever to, to use some kind of spell to get the creatures uh, rid of the poison condition or paralyzed or any other, why not just use your own curse and uh, help that ally, help the creature to uh, give it another chance to... Uh, to get rid themselves of the very very nasty conditions such as these two um, now this doesn't guarantee but it definitely offers some kind of support and utility to the part you don't want to be one of those like typical marshals that just like does everything for himself right you actually want to help your allies from time to time and blood hunter does allow you to like manipulate a little bit of like blood 
of your allies at least with this uh this curse alone so uh, yeah that's about it for the curses now finally we go to the blood hunter order of the ghost slayer we get right of the dawn now this is a special kind of right it goes back to the crimson it uses like all of the uh, stock crimson right rule so it reduces your own hp by your character level uh, blah 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 but there are specific uh, buts obviously exceptions to those rules uh, your rate your right damage is radiant type now radiant type is not often resisted um, and uh, that's a very good thing to have at level three uh, finally second thing is the damage you suffer from activating this right is halved so at level 20 you would only get 10 damage you would only damage yourself by 10 instead of 20 obviously at level 3 you would damage yourself by like one one damage it's uh, it's it's almost nothing so uh it's very good to have right it's instead of taking three damage to your maximum and current hit points that you would uh, be doing with your ordinary uh rights right so if you take uh, any of these rights you have to hurt yourself by full uh, damage of your character level uh, but uh, with the with the right of the dawn you only take half of that damage so yeah I think it's v it's another very very good thing to have like now you now we are combining the ghost slayer which deals less damage to you with the uh, with the uh, dwarf which gives you additional hit points uh, by uh, from the like racial trait uh, so yeah we are this blood hunter is definitely gonna have more hit points than most other blood hunters out there. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely there's that. Uh, with that said, pretty much that's about it. Uh, yeah, additionally you do deal wisdom damage, wisdom modifier additional damage if you are fighting undead creatures. Uh, for the majority of your, at least for the first 10 levels of this character, you're only gonna be dealing this additional uh, wisdom modifier damage uh, to undead creatures but upon reaching level 11 uh, you are going to be dealing this additional uh, radiant uh, damage equaling your wisdom modifier uh, to everybody so all the creatures that you hit with your right of the dawn will be suffering this additional radiant damage and obviously uh, going back to the amount of attacks that you have crossbow expert giving you a bonus action attack uh, f uh, eventually you will be getting extra attacks so three or even four attacks uh, depending on your level uh, that's a lot of like stacked up damage just from your wisdom modifier so yeah definitely once again this is a build that heavily relies on wisdom much more on wisdom than on dexterity um, so yeah you would get five ability score increases at level f pretty much standard uh, distribution at level four 8, 12, uh, 16, and finally 19. Uh, obviously, you would be taking feats uh, first. That's what you usually do with most characters because feats are awesome, feats rock. But after that, I would definitely maximize wisdom. Uh, I would put wisdom to 20 as soon as possible. And finally, with your last level 19, if you ever even reach this level, I would put plus 2 to dex. Uh, you're pretty much you don't really need that much dex in this case sure i mean with higher dex your uh, accuracy will be increased but you already have a, a archery fighting style which gives a plus two to your range attack roll so you kind of like cover for the lack of dexterity with just your fighting style so yeah you definitely do not need as much dex especially if you have like a cleric or uh, any kind of uh, uh, spellcaster in a party which will give you a bless or maybe put a greater invisibility on you or uh, I don't know just cast fairy fire on enemies giving you advantage you pretty much don't need that, mu that much dex you can kind of rely on your teammates uh, to give you a little bit of a boost to accuracy at least that's my experience in like playing at the half optimized parties at least one party member has some kind of a support in combat which pretty much gives you an easier time of hit, uh, uh, hitting the enemies. Uh, so yeah, basically uh, that is it for for that. Now, uh, uh, extra attack at level 5. It's a standard level 5 uh, martial feature. You're like a proper martial class. You get extra attack. Uh, not much to say. Whenever you take the attack action, you can attack twice instead of once. Um, yeah, that's about it. At level 7 you get uh, Hallowed Wanes. Now, I think this is the feature that really puts Ghost Slayer, uh, Blood Hunter above all the other Blood Hunters in just the sheer 
universal uh, kind of uh, tool set that you have. Because just this fact alone, that beginning at level 7, you can use your blood curses, the blood maledicts, right? That we uh, talked about before, the binding, the eyeless, the fending, purgation, all the others that you take. You can take those curses and now, instead of just relying on your DM to tell you, yes, this creature has blood on, or no, this creature doesn't have blood, you can definitely now use those curses on all sorts of creatures, uh, regardless of whether their form uh, has or doesn't have blood. Uh, so yeah, also when you amplify uh, your blood maledict feature, uh, after rolling the amplified damage, if you roll like max damage, you can uh, re-roll. Uh, but uh, if you re-roll, you have to use the new roll. So basically, if you if you get like 5 or 6 damage on a d6, you can kind of like choose to re-roll, because odds are you're gonna low, roll lower. Uh, but yeah, basically, if you get like 1 or 2, you will pretty much, you, won't, you don't even want to re-roll, because that's a very minimum amount of damage that you take. So yeah, I mean, this is additional, you, you, you will be able to like squeeze even more hit points, uh, once you hit level 7, uh, because this feature obviously will allow you to, to just in theory uh, receive less damage from amplifying all of those blood curses. Uh, in other words, you will be hurting yourself a little bit less in order to get the same result from all of these uh, curses, amplified uh, blood curses. So yeah, I think this feature is very, very good. Um, I never played this particular blood hunter, but just playing a different type of blood hunter. Uh, the mutant, um, I know how much damage you take from using these blood curses, amplifying them. And sometimes you really hate taking 8 damage. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Hello Vance will enable you to reroll those 8s and 6s and whatnot, right? So yeah, it's a very, very good. At level 9, you get a thing that's called Grim Psychometry. Uh, now this is sort of like... A, ribbon feature because it's gonna depend whether there's some kind of even uh, thing that you can use this on it's kind of a lacklusterly whatever defined this described there are a lot of a lot of things that uh, resolve this feature are up to dm but still if you encounter some kind of a cursed item or an item with some kind of dark history you might you might be able to use this feature to find out more information about the item so who knows you know maybe this feature becomes like the most critical feature in your campaign because you know you're the only one who can figure out what kind of curse ancient curse relies upon the item nobody else can do it other than you right so yeah it's definitely situational it's dependent on the dm the campaign the setting the type of items objects that you encounter but it can definitely be useful uh, now, Dark Velocity, uh, com compared to Grim Psychometry, at a level 10 feature, which is definitely going to be useful in, in almost or, or all sorts of situations. Because, first and foremost, uh, when you reach level 10, your Dark Vision increases up to uh, 90 feet. You already have uh, 60 from Dwarf, now you have 90. Um, so, uh, and, and on top of that, your speed increases by 10 feet if you are in Dim Light or Darkness. And also, attacks of opportunity made against you will be you will be at disadvantage if you are in dim light or, or darkness. So basically, you kind of definitely want to like uh, stick to dark corners, uh, because whenever you're in a dark corner or in a dark corridor, dark room, you you are more you are faster, and you are harder to hit if you want to to slip out of the uh, enemy's uh, attacks. Uh, without using this uh, disengage right so if you just want to like use your full speed to get as far away from the enemy uh, you, uh, the enemy will have disadvantage if you are in a uh, 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 dim light or darkness so uh, this is definitely not gonna be that much useful to you because your sorry your ac is gonna be on the lower end by the time you reach this level your ac is pretty much gonna be stuck at 16 for like the for like the all, all, almost all of your uh, adventuring career unless you get some kind of I don't know uh, magical armor that gives you a plus one or plus two to AC but yeah your AC is definitely gonna be on the lower end but still I mean sometimes you will want to move out of the enemy away from the enemy and uh, attacks of opportunity will be made a disadvantage so yeah it's all, it's all these good things like little things that stack on top of each other so yeah, it's, it's definitely a good thing. Now, uh, at level 
At level 11, uh, we go back to the Ghost Slayer, you get the Fabled Supernal Surge. Now, Supernal Surge is, as I said before, uh, it's heavily dependent on your Wisdom modifier, so... Uh, once you get it, you will want to increase your Wisdom modifier, to max your Wisdom modifier to plus 5. Because, uh, when you take the attack action, instead of just having two attacks, uh, with your extra attack, you can attack three times. Uh, instead of twice, obviously, and you temporarily become spectral when you are in this like temporary spectral form You can move through other creatures objects as, they, as, as if they were difficult terrain uh, Remember you already you already have additional movement speed if you're in dim light or darkness and also you have a uh, uh, the the, uh, the squat nimbleness which gives you additional plus five walking speed. So yeah, you would you would be decently fast uh, so you would be able to position yourself with this feature more favorably uh, Than you would be with just like being a straight-up like physical form marshal, right? So you do take 1d10 force damage if you end your turn inside of an object But uh, you will definitely want to avoid that right like in a majority of situations and just the fact that you can attack three times uh, even four because with uh, with the uh, with the hand crossbow in your hand and the crossbow expert feet you can use your bonus action attack to uh, bonus action to attack once again so three attacks with your action and one attack with your bonus action it's like four attacks and uh, don't forget at level 11 your right of the dawn also uh, becomes of it, it becomes into its full power because at level 11 also your right of the dawn now uh, inflicts additional uh, wisdom modifier radiant damage to all of the creatures so at level 11 you actually get a huge power bump because uh, one more attack you you can you can like change your form you can move through creatures objects uh, positioning becomes way way easier um, yeah I mean this is this is a re actually very very good feature uh, at level 14 we get the uh, standard blood hunter heart and soul now it, it is a fairly late that you get uh, immunity to frightened condition and advantage against magical charms but even at level 14 getting some kind of mechanical uh, immunity resistance advantage is a good thing even though I think it's kind of like a more of a ribbon feature at this point because um, yeah, I mean frightened and charm conditions affect you more at lower levels, but I mean yeah sure Sometimes you might even get affected by this at higher levels. So Who knows this might actually be very useful at level that you get uh, depends on what monsters the DM uh, throws on you, right? So yeah, it's a very very good thing at level 15 you get gravesight uh, from the uh, ghost slayer not only can you see through the ordinary mundane darkness, you can now see through magical darkness. And you can also see invisible creatures, uh, both features work up to 30 feet distance, a range, radius, reach, whatever. Uh, it's uh, fairly late into your character progression, but just the fact that you can see invisible creatures and can see through magical darkness, uh, even though you're a fairly high level and warlocks can do this well, at least they can see through magical darkness at level 2 if they choose to do so with Devil's Sight. Um, it's still just, I mean, you're not a caster, you're not a warlock and you just get this feature. A lot of monsters will be relying on, a lot of spell casters will be relying on invisibility against you. So you will just be able to see them. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a very, very good thing, um, even though you get it a bit late. Uh, Vengeful Spirit, it's like a textbook example of a double-edged sword uh, Because when you get dropped to zero hit points, you can choose to like let your spirit fight on uh, So uh, instead of your party losing your your attacks your action economy, you can choose to uh, Continue using your action economy even though you're at zero hit points, but if you take just one point of damage any type of damage you are immediately dead so I'd say in a majority of situations you will still pretty much want to keep at zero hit points and wait for the druid, cleric or bard to cast healing word on you instead of just, I don't know, uh, getting up and uh, getting AoE damage in your face and then just dying, like uh, outright dying. But in a rare case where you would be fighting something, someone or a monster NPC, which deals cold, necrotic or non-magical weapon damage. 
Uh, there's pretty much zero risk because you are immune to those three uh, types of damage while you are in this vengeful spirit form, let's say, in this like spectral form. Uh, and in that case, I would definitely say, yeah, go for it. Uh, and even like if you're fighting a monster that has a different type of damage, but you are like you're like the last hope of the party uh, uh, for it to not be a total typical, like total party kill. Uh, so all of your party members are down at low hit points, zero hit points, like you drop down to zero hit points. You pretty much like have almost nothing to lose. So yeah, this gives you like a final stand, uh, a final chance of redeeming your soul, your spirit of defeating the monster that you're fighting. It's pretty much like a boss fight. A thing that you will maybe even want to use like in a final fight at the end of the campaign because like if you're gonna get killed might as well go out in style right so um, yeah that's about it at level 20 you get the sanguine mastery uh, now this is this feature is kind of like you definitely uh, the first part of the feature uh, revolves around you having like less than 25% of hit points I would definitely say that it's foolish to it intentionally hurt yourself, to put yourself at risk by going below 25% of hit points just to be able to maximize your crimson right damage. But at level 20, you're pretty much guaranteed if the DM is gonna throw like some stupid, stupid, uber, retarded OP monsters at you, you're pretty much almost guaranteed to, to, of a possibility of dropping below 25% hit points. And in that case, Blood Curse of the Marked, uh, well, at least at level 20, right, uh, is a very good thing to have because your Crimson Right damage is doubled. And with Sanguine Mastery, if you are below 25%, uh, your Crimson Right damage is maximized. So, basically, your D10 would be dealing uh, 10 damage with with the with the blood curse of the marked you would be dealing 20 because uh, 10 doubled is 20 right with the uh, and on top of that if you choose to use the most damaging crossbow which is a heavy crossbow uh, you will be dealing 1d10 plus 29 damage per hit now uh, you will be you will have to use your bonus section to use the blood curse of the marked but you still have three attacks because with, uh, with the Supernal Surge, you have three attacks, depending on how long you ha how high your Wisdom modifier is. But at level 20, your Wisdom should be 20. So, you definitely have five rounds where you can use... Where you can have three attacks per attack action. So, when you get dropped to, to below 25%, uh, you have three attacks, each attack dealing 29 plus 1d10 damage. This is not... A, this is a decent amount of damage. Uh, and uh, also the potential to regain your blood maledicts, your blood curses, uh, is actually probably going to be more useful to you, because uh, every time you score a critical hit, you get one of those uses back. Um, now, you only, like, the they are a short rest feature, the blood maledicts are a short rest feature, but you only have, like, four of them, and if you want to rely on them, uh, more than uh, more than maybe uh, the amount of uses uh, you have is definitely like you want to have as many attacks as possible use as many of these curses as possible just like uh, stretch your action economy stretch your resources to their max and uh, sanguine master is gonna enable you to do just that because with three or four attacks you're pretty much gonna you're pretty much guaranteed to land at least one crit per combat if the combat lasts like two or three rounds in most cases, right? Like, sometimes you'll just be critically missing everything. It's just like a, a, a fate of the D20. But yeah, that's about it. For this build... I'm sorry, I'm having like... Uh, uh, things are <laughs> uh, uh, going back to my mouth. I just like... Uh, I just ate. So yeah, basically, uh, some kind of tactics and progressions that I would consider. Uh, this build is viable at any level, but it definitely peaks around level 11 and 12. Uh, at level 12, you will get an ability score increase, obviously, so at this level, you would pretty much put your Wisdom to 18. With your Order feature, uh, Supernal Surge, you would have, like, plus 4 to Wisdom, so you would have, like, 3 attacks per, per, per attack action, and uh, you would be able to do it 4 times per short rest. 
uh, a lot of this uh, thing is a short rest uh, dependent so yeah pretty much like i'm gonna put uh, the defining uh, uh defining uh, a feature of this build is like short rest dependent yeah because uh, why not it definitely is like a lot of these mechanics almost all of them go off of short rest so uh yeah sound of tactics is definitely going to be uh for you to get a light or heavy crossbow as soon as possible if you are regularly fighting a longer distance uh, than your hand crossbows short range of 30 feet allows you so for example if you are fighting a lot in the wilderness and if you're fighting uh, ranged attack monsters that use their own ranged attacks that have like 50 100 or even more range definitely get a light or heavy crossbow or even just an ordinary longbow uh, because uh, you definitely don't want to shoot at disadvantage because that's just stupid right it's better to have two attacks that are going to be ordinary attacks than three attacks that are going to be made with disadvantage because a disadvantage are pretty much like uh, minimizing your odds of landing the shots uh, so yeah uh, no need to have right of the dawn or any of the rights active on multiple weapons you can pretty much i mean Every time you activate one of these rights, you have to hurt yourself. And to avoid hurting yourself too much, to avoid like lowering your hit points to ridiculously low numbers, uh, I would pretty much have the Right of the Dawn active on my hand crossbow uh, as a default weapon. And I would switch to longer range crossbows or maybe even bows if you have to fight at like a maximum range. Uh, I would use those as needed. Uh, you're not always gonna even need a lot of monsters in 5th edition are melee so 30 feet of range is gonna be definitely with your hand crossbow is gonna be more than more than enough in at least half of the combat encounters that you uh, participate in right now in terms of your ability score increases your first two ability score increases at level 4 and 8 are definitely going to go uh, to your feats. I would get crossbow expert feat at level 4 because at level 4 you would be able to then use your bonus section to kind of like have a de facto two attacks per turn and then at level 5 you would get extra attacks so you would have three attacks per turn and each of those attacks would be dealing 1d6 additional uh, radiant damage per hit so it's a very very decent damage output for a level 5 character. It's pretty much on par with any ranger or uh, I don't know any any fighter with a, with a, with a crossbow out there, right? So, yeah, definitely a very very good uh, on like definitely on par with a lot of those martial classes just in in terms of like a pure damage output. And don't forget your uh, crimson right damage is magical. So, even if your uh, bow, even if your crossbow is a mundane crossbow, you will still be able to use your Crimson Rite damage as a magical damage, so at least part of the resistances of monsters are gonna be negated by the uh, fact that all of this all of this damage that is gonna be coming their way, 3d6 uh, with the hand crossbow is gonna be magical. So, yeah, definitely that. Uh, squat Nimbleness at level 8 uh, is pretty much uh, will round your deck, so you will be starting with 15 in Dexterity, now you would have 16, um, you would increase your walking speed, get proficiency in athletics, it's always good to have proficiency in additional skills, uh, and also have advantage on, uh, on uh, checks to escape the grapple. Um, so yeah, it would definitely make you more mobile, more, more slippery. Level 12 and 16, I would maximize wisdom, uh, because wisdom, as we discussed uh, over the course of this video, is the, is the ability that you use for almost all of the features uh, it, uh, that this class relies on. All of the blood maledicts, like majority of them, your uh, order feature also at level 11 uh, is, it goes off of wisdom. So yeah, definitely Wisdom is the primary ability of this build, I would say. Uh, at level 9, I would reserve upping my Dexterity to 18, uh, to level... Uh, I would reserve, uh, reserve that to level 19. I don't think you need to increase your Dexterity above 16 uh, anytime before, like, the last ability score improvement, because, I mean, sure, increasing Dexterity increases the damage, first and foremost increases the accuracy increases your initiative and increases all of your uh, skill uh, proficiencies that go off of uh, dexterity but 
Um, wisdom is definitely gonna be more useful to you because as a ghost slayer, again, your blood maledicts, your blood curses do not rely on your DM uh, telling you whether the monsters do or do not have blood. Because once you hit level 7, you get those hallowed wanes and you can use your uh, blood maledict, blood curses on any creature, regardless of whether they have blood or not. So wisdom is the, is the ability to go for, at least in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, with that said, let's just quickly go over a couple of things that uh, you kind of like can do with this uh, build. So, let's just let's just go over the pure damage, right? So, uh, this would be sort of like your level 20 character uh, of this build. Decent, like, armor class definitely a bit on the lower end, but then again, you're not a melee class, you're like a... You're a ranged class that definitely doesn't want to even get into the melee if, if, if possible. Your dexterity is gonna be 18, it's not gonna be max, but 18 is good. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's just like minus one to, uh, to the modifier. Let's, let's th think about it as that. Um, a plus five to wisdom, maximize wisdom, decent skill proficiencies. Uh, very decent saving throws. Intelligence and Charisma minus one is definitely gonna hurt somewhat in the later stages of the character progression. Because in tier 3 and tier 4, Charisma and Intellect save throws do come occasionally. because Do come definitely more often because spells and monsters do inflict more uh effects that call for these saving throws but i mean you cannot be good in everything right other than maybe if you're a monk then you can be proficient in everything if you're a paladin you can have plus five to everything but yeah you're not you're none of those those things you are a blood hunter so in terms of hit points you have a decent amount of hit points uh just the fact that right of the dawn deals half of the damage to you means that instead of taking 20 damage uh, when your Rite of the Dawn gets activated on any of those three weapons, you will take only minus 10. So your, your like, hit points are gonna be 194, which is decent for a level 20 character who is not even a melee character, right? So a lot of melee characters end up with, like, less amount of hit points than you. So uh, this is definitely a decent amount of uh, HP. Um, in terms of damage, a level 12, which is sort of like a level where I think this build peaks, your uh, ordinary damage per round uh, is somewhere around 60. Now, this is actually a very, very dependent type of damage, because you would have three attacks with your action, uh, extra attack would give you two attacks, supernal surge will give you one more, uh, and also hand crossbow would give you additional bonus action attacks So with all of these attacks combined and all the damages and all of the additional damage you get from wisdom uh, And uh, dexterity you would be somewhere around 60 now at level 20 uh, When you get below 25% hit points and uh, that's one of those things where uh, uh, the sanguine mastery uh, comes up, right? Uh, Sanguine Master pretty much uh, tells you when you are below 25, your Crimson Rite damage dice are maximized. So, instead of using your bonus action to shoot once again, uh, use your Blood Curse of the Marked, which would double your right damage. So, doubling the maximized damage will pretty much result in a, in a flat out plus 60 damage from your... Uh, Blood Curse and your Sanguine Mastery and your Right. So combining all of those three features together is just a flat out plus 60 damage. Obviously like with three attacks. Three attacks combined would net like a total plus 60. Plus 3d10 from a heavy crossbow. Uh, let's say you want to go for the maximum amount of damage. And a plus 27 from your Dexterity and Wisdom mod. It's a decent amount of damage for five rounds. And you can do you can do this every time you short rest because uh, the uh, the wisdom uh, the 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 supernal surge gets reset every time you short rest. So yeah, I mean uh, the fact that the, all of a lot of these features are short rest once again is really gonna make this build very very reliable in a campaign that has a lot of combat. Uh, because in a lot of situations when you have a characters who can go Nova like kill a monster in like a single turn. They kind of spend themselves and then all of they have left is like extra attack, like basic 20-30 damage they have. Well, in your case, you definitely can rev it up, you can amp it up 
Uh, if you go out there, get hurt, even though I would advise, advise against uh, dropping at dangerously low uh, levels of hit points. But if you do, if you are below 25%, and in your case that would be like, uh, let's say, uh, 0 0.25 times 1 or... Yeah, if you are below 48 hit points, if you are basically at 48 hit points, which is a very low amount of hit points, you can, you can start dishing out this ridiculous like 100 damage per round, just combining your curse, the right damage and the, the sanguine mastery. But I mean, sure, this is a level 20 thing that you can do, you should kind of like be able to do this at level 20 uh, at the very least. You have a decent amount of proficiencies, a decent amount of options at your disposal. Uh, I'd say this is a fairly balanced character, even though, uh, again, I would say that blood hunters are definitely overall on the weaker end of the power curve because this class is decent in terms of fluff flavor like i i really like the way i imagine these characters uh, i just like the, the theme but mechanically you kind of this is this is about it you know uh if you want to eke out a little bit more damage into this character you can definitely go with a sharp shooter feat but I would say, uh, in, if you want, to, if you want to go with the dwarf, you definitely do not want to uh, to to rob yourself of any more ability score increases because um, taking up, leaving yourself with like 16 in dexterity at level 20, eh, not really that good. But I mean, you can definitely choose to do so if you want to go for the max amount of damage. Especially if you have a party which which gives you a lot of buffs, blesses, fairy fires, advantages, and whatnot. So yeah, this is actually about it that you can go with Blood Hunter. At least in my opinion, um, this is a very well-rounded character. Not like nothing is uh, overly specialized, but you still have a lot of hurt to do. You still have a lot of options to do with your curses. You have a decent amount of hit points, like a buffer, a pool of hit points that you can rely on. Uh, and not be afraid of dropping to zero hit points every time you use one of those blood curses and uh, uh, rights, right? Because every time you uh, you use a, a crimson right, every, every time you use right of dawn and uh, stack that with blood curses, your hit points start going down way too fast and you get d dropped down to zero hit points very, very fast. So, yeah, this is my attempt of making a character which is going to be useful at any stage of the game. Uh, I say once again uh, as a final sort of like a, a wrap is that it sort of like peaks around level 11, 11, 12, but it's definitely useful all the way up to level 20, at least in my opinion. Um, yeah, if you like this build, if you like this character, like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button, uh, you know the drill. If you want to get notified of my future uploads, you definitely need to click that uh, bell icon. Um, I'll have more videos coming up soon. Uh, uh, some of the videos are going to be from the sessions that I started DMing recently. Online campaigns, which I've been announcing on my channel last month. So yeah, uh, stay tuned uh, for that. It's going to be up on the channel soon. Uh, and yeah, basically that's about it. Uh, Minmax Munchking... Uh, uh, oh yeah, before before we finish, uh, once again, if you uh, want these uh, files, if you want these notes, definitely head over to my Patreon, uh, Patreon page, uh, and uh, uh, join the uh, do join the what's the called the magical secrets uh, tier. You also get uh, Discord rewards. You get these. You get access to my uh, super secret uh, Discord server. So yeah, we you, we can talk there if you want to. And yeah, uh, basically that's about it for this video. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Once again, once again, hit the bell button. Uh, Min Max Munch King out, and uh, talk to you soon.